This is a Flint Hills Oral History Project World War II Veterans Series interview with Mr. Robert Allen Mott of San Diego, California. Mr. Mott is a former resident of Lyon County and was a member of Company B, 137th Infantry, Kansas National Guard when it was called into the Federal Service in December of 1940. The interviewer is Lauren Pennington, Emeritus Professor of History at Emporia State University. Today's date is September 30th, 2006, and because Mr. Mott is a visitor in Emporia, the interview is taking place at the interviewer's home, 1737 Troman Way in Emporia. This is tape one, side A. Mr. Mott, I should note here at the beginning that while you and I have met once or twice over the years, we have not had any close contact until we made arrangements for this interview. We shall, uh, nevertheless, try to make this interview as informal as possible. Uh, I should uh, like to have you begin by giving us a sketch of your life before you entered active military service in December 1940. That is, when and for where you were born, who your parents were, what they did for a living, where you went to school, and where you worked. Uh, first, Lauren, thanks for the opportunity to do this uh, interview. Uh, I've known about projects such as this for a long, long time and uh, have thought about uh, having an oral history done, but I've never gotten around to it, so I appreciate the uh, offer that you've made to me, and I'll do my best to answer all your questions. That first question uh, is one that requires a little longevity in the response. I'm a native of Missouri. I was born down in the southwest corner of the state near Joplin in a small town called Carterville uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> lived there for a couple of years. My father and mother were both uh, uh, teachers, school teachers. Uh, my father was a teacher and a small school uh, administrator. He was superintendent of schools all of my life growing up through high school until I moved to Emporia. And uh, so uh, we were prone to move a little bit around Missouri, and we did. Uh, I said I was born in Carterville. Uh, my mother stopped teaching, and she became a full-time uh, mother because I had two sisters older than I and two sisters younger than I. And so there was a family of five. I was the only boy, and I, I was in the middle. But my dad continued to be a superintendent of schools, and I still can remember the small towns where we lived. Uh, after we uh, left uh, Carterville, we moved to Buffalo, Missouri. And uh, we were there for about four years, and then we moved to a town called Cold Camp, which is up near Sedalia. And then we moved to Warsaw, and I was there for four years. Of course, I was going through the schooling process. I entered school in Coal Camp, went to school there for a couple of years, um, then <clears throat> moved on to uh, Warsaw and went through uh, elementary school there. And uh, we uh, <clears throat> enjoyed Warsaw because at that time they were building the uh, Bagnell Dam on the Lake of the Ozarks. And the Lake of the Ozarks was created along the Osage River. Warsaw wasn't close to the dam, it was up at the far end of the lake, but that was an exciting time to see that hydropower development in, uh, in the Ozarks. It was one of the first in the, in the country. I can interrupt you just a minute. I presume that was some part of the New Deal relief program? No, it wasn't. Oh, it that wasn't. Was, that was a private enterprise uh, project by one of the power companies in Missouri. It had no uh, government funding whatsoever. I think that was one of the things that was interesting and un unusual about it. Especially in the 1930s. <coughs> exactly. Okay. That early, yeah. Well, I'll let you, I'll let you go ahead from there. Um, <coughs> after we moved from Warsaw, we moved to a town about 65 miles south of Kansas City on Highway 71, Adrian, Missouri. <coughs> and that's where I really, I guess, begin to realize that uh, there was a life ahead and that I would have to stop playing games and, uh, and get serious. Is this uh, when you were going to high school? Yes, that's right. I, f I graduated from the eighth grade at Adrian, Missouri, and I was the only kid in my class to be wearing knickers. All the other boys had short pants, 
but I still had was still wearing knickers. The class picture uh, I remember with some chagrin that uh, I was out of uniform, so to speak. But uh, that was the situation we were in at that time. Um, <clears throat> went to high school in Adrian for two years. My dad was superintendent of schools. I got in a couple of three fights and. Uh, got called to the superintendent's office a number of times for discussions about that, but uh, we got those things worked out. I will say it's not much fun being uh, the son of a superintendent of schools when you're growing up in, uh, in, in high school. One of the things you haven't told me yet, Bob, is I'm interested in knowing the names of your father and mother. My father's name is Hugh, H-U-G-H, Hugh Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N, Mott. And uh, his family uh, settled in uh, the Ozarks, and he was born east of Springfield, Missouri, in a small town called Orla, a very small town. It's out near Lebanon and uh, Mountain Grove in that area of Missouri. He was one of seven brothers. He was the, turned out to be the only Democrat in the group. All the others were Republicans. My mother was uh, name was uh, Alice Marguerite Longman uh, Mott. Um, her mother and father emigrated from England to the United States, had settled in Iowa, and then moved uh, to South Missouri. Uh, their home was in Aurora, Missouri, which is uh, to the slightly to the east of, of Springfield. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> a lovely little small town in the in the foothills of the Ozarks. Um, my mother's father, my grandfather, was a miller in um, in Aurora. My on the dad's side, and she had uh, two sisters, uh, both of whom were teachers, and uh, ended teaching in the Beaumont, uh, Texas uh, school system. One was a, 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 librar a librarian. And uh, as I say, they both taught in Oklahoma and in Texas. But as I said earlier, my mother stopped teaching when, uh, when the five of us uh, uh, came along. Um, well, we'll go back then and, and we'll talk about you. You were, you were going to school uh, in uh, Adrian, uh, Missouri, graduating there from high school. Well, well I didn't did graduate play? from high school. That's, oh, that, that's where the story breaks. Okay, we'll, we'll go on ahead with the story. <coughs> Yeah, the interesting, the interesting part of, of what happened was my father realized at some point in his life that he was not going to have a great financial estate to pass on to the five of us. And he said to us, not once but many times, I'm not going to be able to leave you much money, but I want to see that all of you get a college education. He had graduated from the normal school at Springfield. And uh, my mother had gone to school there. She was not a graduate. And my father had uh, gotten a master's degree in, in the 20s, around 1926 or 27. He did that in the customary way that school teachers used to do that in those days. He went to uh, Columbia University in New York for one summer term. And uh, then he went to the University of Missouri in Columbia and received his master's degree. I think it was in 1927, give or, give or take a year. So <clears throat> they knew the value of education, and we all were conscious of it. And uh, <clears throat> my father was determined that we were to get uh, college educations. And he sort of made an assumption that uh, because he was a teacher, we all were going to be teachers as well. And in a in a sense, part, part of that was true to my two older sisters, one two years older than I and another four years older than I, did teach in Kansas, a variety of, of Kansas schools, and uh, my two younger sisters did not teach. And uh, <clears throat> as we'll talk about later, I did do some uh, college and university uh, teaching uh, later in my career. But my dad decided that we to, to ensure this commitment that he'd made, that we all get a college education, he decided we should uh, find a college town and move to that college town. And he sort of canvassed all the schools in Missouri, and he took a look at the schools, 
out in Kansas, and he settled on Kansas State Teachers College in Emporia. And he, he told us he picked Emporia for a couple of reasons. Um, one was there were two schools there. The College of Emporia was functional at that time, and of course he thought Kansas State Teachers College was an, an institution that would be appropriate for us. So in 1936, after I had finished my sophomore year at uh, Adrian, Missouri, we moved to Emporia, Kansas. My father had gone out in 19, gone out, I say gone out from Adrian, gone to Emporia, and he, he bought a house. He bought a house at 202 West 13th Avenue, just off the campus. And I want to say that <clears throat> I don't go by and look at that house anymore, but when we lived there, it was a lovely uh, street with trees branching over the street. The street was brick. Uh, all the houses had front porches, and uh, Dutch Elm came along, killed all the trees, and the street never looked the same since. But it was a, it was a lovely setting. It was close to the campus. Several faculty people lived in the neighborhood. The uh, football coach, basketball coach, lived two houses down, a couple of English profs lived across the street. It was nice. But he came out and bought this house. I have no idea where he got the money for that house. I simply do not know because we were, we were not rolling in wealth. We were poor and just we didn't know it. He had a pretty good salary. He had a steady salary, but <clears throat> he had no resources. But somehow, he managed to get it together in the height of the, of the Depression, and he bought that property. And uh, uh, that was about 1934. We moved along in 36. He stayed back in Adrian and taught and was superintendent for another year while the family moved out. My older sisters had gone to a year or two of college by that time, and to help support our <coughs> education, they would go out and teach school in a small town someplace and then come back and, and go to school again. At any rate, back to my story, moved to Emporia in the summer of 1936. It was hot, it was dry, it was the Dust Bowl era. Times were, were exceedingly tough. There was no rain, there was no air conditioning. Uh, but we made the move. And now I'm in a big city of Emporia having lived in towns of about a thousand or so population all of my life, and I don't know a soul. And my sister, two years younger than I, uh, were both enrolled in Emporia High, I as a junior, and she as a sophomore. And the reason she was just a year behind me is because my dad, in his wisdom, had decided that she was a bright kid, and he moved her up a year when she started school back in Missouri. So here were the two of us. We knew each other, but we didn't know anybody else. But <clears throat> we went to Emporia High, and it was good. I uh, got in the band. I played the flute and the piccolo, not very well, but I did play them. I'd started playing the instruments in, in Adrian. And uh, I got on the basketball team and uh, made the basketball squad. And uh, <clears throat> I guess I was a reasonably good student. I made the uh, what do they call it, the National Honor Society. I was elected to the National Honor Society in my senior year, and I graduated from Emporia High in 1938, and as you might know, I immediately enrolled in Kansas State Teachers College and entered KSTC in uh, the fall of, of 38. What, what sort of a curriculum did, were you Take, were, going to, were you going to take it at Kansas State Teachers College? I didn't have the slightest idea of what I was going to do at Kansas State I didn't State mean to Teachers interrupt College. you, then. I'll let you go no, ahead. No, it's there. quite all right. I didn't, I didn't have any idea. I just knew I was going to school, and I didn't think I wanted to teach. I had no concept at all of what, where my career would go. I had no thought, no desire. I just didn't have a clue use the vernacular about uh, where I was headed uh, in my uh, adult life. But several things happened. Uh, as I've indicated, times were tough, and the Roosevelt administration was doing a number of things to help uh, young students. They had a project called the National Youth Administration, the NYA, 
and you were paid 25 cents an hour uh, for working at some campus job. Uh, there was a lot of leaf raking going on <laughs> in those projects, but that's a necessary activity on a university campus in this part of the world. And uh, there were other opportunities. And by some fate that I cannot explain, I was assigned to uh, work on a stage crew. For 25 cents an hour, I was to help build stage seniors for the university uh, productions. And I did that. My two older sisters were now <coughs> back in school, so three of us were at the university at the same time. They were upper class people, juniors and seniors. And I think they were instrumental to a degree because they were, they were not performers, they were not actors, but they were interested in the technical side of the theater and lighting and stage management and that sort of thing. So that was, a, I think, was an incentive. At any rate, I got the NYA job for 25 cents an hour uh, working, building stage scenery, and that impacted on me in the sense that I realized I was interested in doing something that was creative. And uh, from that, I uh, sort of branched a little bit into journalism and been doing some work on the, on the bulletin. The local radio station then called KTSW was coming on the air. I believe that's KVOE now. It's so. KVOE now, but it was KTSW then in the Broadview Hotel and uh, uh, studios and offices in the, in the Broadview. And uh, I had an opportunity to do some, some work, a little bit of work, uh, not as a paid employee at the radio station uh, until after the war, but let's get to that later. But before the war, the uh, university was producing uh, some programs, including a series of programs that were broadcast on six radio stations around the uh, state. Remember, no television then, and not as many radio stations as they are as there are now. Uh, so before the war, uh, if you had six stations in Kansas spread out, you covered a lot of the state. And this uh, series was called the Kansas School of the Air and they were dramatic presentations designed uh, for classroom utilization. So I got involved in doing some of that. So those are some of the things that clued me a little bit into the creative, into the creative side of the business. I continued at Emporia State moving along this sort of vague route that I was on, not being sure what I wanted to do, wanted to do. And I recall at one time I was being counseled uh, between semesters by one of the faculty people, Ray Mall, and uh, Ray uh, was a very precise, concise type of person, and we were talking and he was asking me a similar question to what you asked me a moment ago, what was it I wanted to do uh, with, with my life, what was my career plan or scheme? And uh, he was looking over a transcript on the desk and talking to me about it. And I said to him, I don't really have many ideas about what I, I want to do yet as a sophomore. And he said, well, uh, I'm looking at your transcript here. He says, uh, you, did, uh, you did well in shop. This was in high school. This, no, this is when I was in, in college, oh, this was but he year. was referring. But, but, I mean, your transcript was He was school. referring to my high school transcript, okay. right. He was referring to my high school transcript, which said uh, to him on the transcript that I had taken shop courses. And I said, uh, Dr. Ball, I, I've never taken a shop course in, in my life. So we got to looking at the transcript, and we discovered that what had happened was there were two families of Mott's in Emporia, unrelated. One lived on West 13th, <coughs> one family. The other family lived on West 15th. Uh, both of us pretty large families, five kids in our family, and I think they had at least three girls and a couple of boys. There was a Bill Mott, there was a Rob, another Robert Mott. So there we were, we had two Robert Motts in the Emporia High System graduating together, and I end up going to Emporia State University uh, on his transcript. So we got that straightened out, and, <laughs> and I was legitimate once again. and. Uh, I'm not saying that Ray Mall helped me particularly, but um, he sort of 
made me realize in this counseling session that it was time I started to uh, think about this. And one of the things I thought about was that uh, I need to help um, with this family contribution. I need to pitch in and start to earn a little money as a kid uh, here in Emporia. I was a substitute carrier for a Gazette route. A young chap named Dick Kasperi uh, had the route, but when uh, he wasn't able to cover it, I would throw the Gazette up in around between 12th and 15th Street, around rural, up in, in that area for him. So I was picking up a little loose change, but not, not doing very well. But one opportunity to raise a little money in Emporia at that time was to join the National Guard. And a lot of college students did that. Many college students joined the Guard. There were two units, Company B, 137th Infantry, and um, the 161st Field Artillery Band. And of course the band was made up almost totally, not completely, but almost, uh, of uh, K KSTC students. Um, Company B was predominantly students at uh, either C of E or uh, Emporia State. And you were paid by the federal government uh, one dollar for every drill. Drill was two hours on Monday night. You showed up, up at the armory, which was at Sixth and Merchant, across from the Broadview Hotel on the corner of Sixth and Merchant. It would be the north, uh, northeast corner of the street. And up on the second floor, they had a, a, an office building there, and that's where we went for our Monday drills. Oh, if I can break in just a minute, you said that uh, you were paid a dollar a month. A, a dollar month, from a, the a federal meeting. government. And also, didn't you get something from the state? Twenty-five cents. Uh, an additional twenty-five cents. So you were getting a total of a dollar. <coughs> right, a dollar if you were a private. Mm -hmm. A dollar and twenty-five cents for drill. and But you also signed a commitment to go to summer camp. And... Uh, uh, so before, you, before you go to summer camp, I, I would like to uh, have you comment on what you thought of the uh, drills that took place here in Emporia. Well, they were pretty elementary, and uh, the drills consisted of two or three things, uh, primarily. One was um, close order drill, which uh, is a basic part of any soldier's introduction to the military. Uh, did you do that out in the street? <coughs> we did. We would march down to, uh, I'm not sure the street, but it was past the junior high school, down near the railroad tracks, a uh, street uh, sort of behind where the old post office used to be at Merchant and Fifth, a little bit beyond that. There was a kind of a warehouse down there. There wasn't any traffic on the street, or very, very little, and <clears throat> there were some lights there, some street lights, and we would go down there and do close order drill. Uh, in, in the street. So you could do that even at night? That's right. We had enough light and we, we would take our weapons, our rifles, and go down and and do the all the command exercises of uh, practicing with uh, the uh, um, manual of arms, moving the rifle from the ground to the shoulder and all of that sort of thing and mar marching around a bit. That was one segment of it which we would do outdoors. In the armory itself, we would we would work, work on weapons training, uh, how to field strip rifles, how to take them apart and put them together. Uh, a rifle company consisted of four platoons, three platoons of riflemen, and a light weapons unit of mortars and machine guns, 50 caliber uh, machine guns. And uh, did you actually have any 50 caliber machine guns? Um, you know, I think I misspoke there. I think those were 30 caliber. 30, 30 caliber machine, I think those were 30 caliber machine guns. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, we did have 30 caliber machine guns. Mm -hmm. We did not have 50 caliber machine guns. And we had a 60 millimeter mortar. Mortars at that time came in 60 millimeter sizes and 81 millimeters. And we didn't have that 81 millimeter mortars and 50 caliber machine guns were for a heavy weapons company in an infantry battalion. So we had th only 30 caliber weapons. We have the old Springfield 03 rifle, and uh, we became very adept at uh, um, 
stripping those weapons and, and learning them. Some of the some of the people I never could, but some of the people could actually do that blindfolded. It was amazing, and uh, we we do that so often. We'd also practice bed rolls, and we'd get instruction in first aid and and sort of book learning types of thing. But it was limited. It was primitive, but it was the best that, that could be done at that particular time. So I joined the guard. On June the 14th, 1939, and uh, <clears throat> my first experience with active duty training was uh, at Fort Riley, out at Camp Funston. We went to uh, Riley sometime in July or August, and of course it was very, very hot, sweaty. I need to interrupt you for one thing before we go to Fort Riley. And that is this. What, what was your opinion of the training you received here in Emporia? Very, uh, it, it was the best they could do, but it was ele absolutely elementary. In it other words, just, it really didn't basics. prepare you for yeah. battle or anything of that I, sort. In no way would it prepare us for battle. No way was there any battle preparation. There. We never did any maneuvers. We never went out into the, this is in the drill training yeah, in, in Emporia at the armory. We never did anything of that site. No, no deployments, uh, no effort to maneuver on the ground, nothing of that sort. We had no vehicles. Um, we did have some kitchen equipment, um, which we took from the armory up to the Riley for summer training. But no, the training was uh, inadequate. Uh, you had no vehicles? No, no, no vehicles. vehicles. Okay. No, no vehicles. When we moved, uh, we went by train. To Riley? To Riley. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll let you pick up there yeah. and, and tell us about your summer experience well, at Riley. The summer camp at Riley was uh, was quite an experience. I was a, I was a rookie. I was a private, and uh, I had been assigned to carry a Browning automatic rifle. I hadn't mentioned that with the uh, <clears throat> each squad in a rifle platoon has a BAR Browning automatic rifle, which has a small tripod and had the capacity to shoot, uh, I think, a uh, magazine of 20 rounds of 20, I believe it was, whereas a Springfield rifle, you could only shoot uh, five rounds in a clip at a time. So that I, I was the added firepower guy. The thing I remember about it is I had to carry the BAR, which was heavier than the <coughs> Springfield rifle, minor point. Um, but the training at Riley was, uh, again, we were out in the field. I honestly don't remember a great deal about that first year, except the food was pretty bad. I was on KP, kitchen police a lot, and latrine duty some as a private. You got the, that sort of thing. But, you know, we were there, and it was, uh, it was an experience that I think brought cohesiveness to the uh, organization. Uh, I won't say the training was spectacular. In all candor, I don't remember very much about the training at Fort Riley. I'm trying to think, and I think we did. I think we went on the rifle range and fired the weapons one day. Very limited amount of firing, but I think we did go on the, on the rifle range and fire fire weapons. I take it this was your only experience of finally firing weapons in the first months you were in the... It was, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, my dad and I had hunted a little bit, and I had fired, um, <clears throat> I, I had tried to be a hunter, I wasn't very good, but no, my first military experience firing a weapon was, was at Fort Riley. So that was the summer of 39. Came back and just to school again, <clears throat> and the next summer I have a better recollection of next summer along. This is when you went to the Minnesota. That's the Minnesota maneuvers, right. The uh, military decided that they would extend the two-week training period to three weeks and that we, we would go to Minnesota and join a large number of other units and uh, maneuver in that area. I'm not sure why they picked Minnesota, but they did. And I recall we were in a tent camp, a temporary tent camp, uh, at Lake um, Mill Lax, M I L L E L capital L A C S Lake Mill Lax was the was the like I think that's redundant. It seems to me maybe Lax is also 
trench for late, so I'm not sure about that. Anyway, we were we were close to that, and we did maneuver uh, uh, about that. We went out into the field. Again, no military vehicles, but they had requisitioned uh, uh, farm vehicles, and uh, part of that maneuver was uh, seeing the famous pictures of the time when uh, you would see a vehicle of some nature with a big sign on the side that said tank, T-A-N-K, to illustrate that this farm vehicle was a tank. There was some of that going on up in the Minnesota maneuvers. That lasted, that was for three weeks, and we were out away from the camp for about half that time, about 10 days, roughly 10, 12 days of that time, sleeping out on the ground pretty much and uh, doing roadblocks. I think the biggest challenge in Minnesota were the mosquitoes. Uh, they were the enemy up there. I, we, we, it was a new experience for us Kansas boys. We had never seen uh, mosquitoes of that, uh, <laughs> of that size and capacity. It was there, though, that a really seminal event occurred, and that was we learned in the summer of 1940 while we were at Lake Mill Lacks on the three-week maneuver, we learned that President Roosevelt was going to federalize the National Guard. And uh, that word This is tape one, side B, and Bob, you were talking about that seminal event uh, uh, while you were up at uh, the Minnesota Maneuvers. Would you like to pick up that? Right. Go ahead. Absolutely, Ron. Uh, what had happened was uh, Roosevelt <clears throat> had done about as much as he could do legally, and perhaps some illegally, to aid the Brits in their fight in <clears throat> World War II. And, of course, we were on the sidelines, not yet engaged in the war in 1939 and 1940. Uh, Roosevelt was renominated for his third term at the Democratic Convention in uh, July of 1940. And uh, shortly thereafter, he federalized the Guard in August. Uh, about a month after he had been renominated, he made the political move to federalize the National Guard. 18 Eighteen infantry divisions were federalized to be activated in the fall of 1940, and he also instituted the draft at that same time. If uh, I may interrupt you there just a minute, I take it, I noticed that after this was announced, there was an influx of recruits into Company B. Not right at first. Uh, not right well, at first. Well, I, I mean... Some people have said, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor was the thing, but actually no. you were getting a, a raft of recruits coming in in late 1941. That is correct. And let me tell you what the incentive was okay. for, for the, that early recruitment. Uh, I just said that Roosevelt had federalized the Guard and instituted the draft. Yeah. You remember the draft passed by a single vote. Oh. Uh, and what happened was young men realized it might be better to join the guard and go with a unit from my hometown where I know people and I know that I will be amongst friends than it is to take my chances in the draft and go off as a lone solitary soldier. In other words, they were looking for some, some structure if they had to go into the military or going into the military. I think that was the big incentive uh, for the recruitment. And then also there was an element, uh, despite the fact that some of us were concerned about the fact that our educations were going to be interrupted and our lives were certainly going to be changed, uh, the fact of the matter was uh, we realized this was an adventure. Here are Kansas boys, who uh, most of whom had not been out of the out of the state of Kansas. I'd been in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, three states in my 20-some years of life, and uh, it, it was a static population. And so they were saying, this, this will be an adventure, and 
It's only for a year. I'll go, I'll do my year service, I'll get come and get back in school. So I think that draft uh, element was a, was a major factor in people coming in. And the second one was, hey, I'd like to go off and do my military service with the hometown boys. So the, the, uh, the, there was some pickup that uh, people that joined the unit quite late. There was I, I think there was a, if I, again, I interrupt you, I, I think you also had a commanding officer, Captain Donella. We had Captain. Who, who, who used uh, a kind of an interesting argument for getting recruits. Yes. Captain, Captain Joe, we call him. Joe Don Allen, J.J. Uh, Don Allen, he was an insurance uh, salesman, uh, good guy, uh, fatherly type. As a matter of fact, his son, uh, Quentin Don Allen, was in the was in the unit. Uh, I believe Quentin was a uh, Captain Don Allen. Uh, I believe uh, encouraged his son, and uh, Quentin was a second lieutenant, as I recall. At any rate, Don Allen's point was: if you join the National Guard. And if we get into uh, a military situation where there's a, a fighting war, uh, you're going to enhance your opportunities to be uh, commissioned officers, to get a commission and become, become officers. His phrase was, you will have your commission in your hip pocket. I remember him saying that in a number of times. That was one of his uh, great uh, recruitment tools, and it worked. You would yeah. have a leg up over the draft. That team. was the point. You would, you would be, be in better shape. You would, despite the my criticism or comment about the uh, training that was not up to par, nonetheless, you would be better off and you would be in better shape than were the others who were coming in. And he was he was right about that. And uh, I don't think it's time to talk about it yet. But what I discovered was as as we moved down, that his statement was correct. Many of the men in Company B uh, ended up as commissioned officers. Including right, yourself. Right in, yes, including, including myself. Now that <clears throat> brings us up to the point pretty much of the mobilization. For the Kansas National Guard, it, the date was the 23rd of December. Uh, some of the units in the Guard were mobilized in late August, some in September, some in October, some in November. I think the Kansas National Guard, which was made up of troops in Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, uh, forming the 35th Division, I think the reason we were delayed is because they didn't have a place to put us. They were building Camp Robinson, Arkansas. Uh, north of uh, Little Rock, six or eight miles north of Little Rock, and uh, the, the camp just wasn't ready. And uh, so when we were uh, mobilized on the 23rd of December, we were one of the last National Guard units to be mobilized. So one of the big questions amongst the fellows that were in the unit is whether or not they should return to school in that fall semester of 1940. Uh, and, uh, 40, I'm sorry, yes. At 40. And uh, I remember that at least four soldiers did that and graduated later at down at Camp Robinson. Uh, Daryl Hogan, the company clerk, was one. Tom Tholen, who was a, a, a private in the service, Hogan, Hogan was, was two at that time. And there were two others, and I can't remember the names, but Tholen and Hogan, I remember, uh, went to school and, uh, in that fall semester and received their diplomas and their graduation at Camp Robinson. Most of the men opted not to enroll in the fall semester. I enrolled. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but I enrolled in four classes, and don't ask me what they were, but uh, I'm sure I wasn't the most attentive student in the world, um, but when the Guard was mobilized, at that time the semester didn't end until about mid-January. So I enrolled in these four classes. I still hadn't completed all the coursework, but my instructors let me do the work from Camp Robinson and send it back to them, and then I took examinations, 
and I, so I got an added 12 hours of credit because I had decided to stay in school. But on the 23rd of December, we meet on a Monday morning in the dark at 6th and the Merchant, stand on the um, sidewalk outside the armory downstairs on the street and take the uh, oath uh, uh, of, uh, of service uh, to the military and to the, and to the country. And we stayed at home for two weeks. Those of us who lived in Emporia uh, were allowed to go home at night and sleep in, in our homes. Uh, those who were away from Emporia, there were a lot of North Lyon County boys from Admire and Miller and uh, the other towns along the northern border. I believe they were called the North uh, the North Lyon County Mafia. That's right. Yeah, they they had it. They had an actual uh, an actual nickname. Yeah, they 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 did. I'd forgotten that. Um, <clears throat> they uh, were uh, housed and billeted in the new uh, William Allen White Auditorium down in the basement. That's where they would uh, spend their nights. Meals, I'm having trouble remembering about meals. We ate out of mess kits, and I think there was a kitchen set up in the armory. I'm not very clear on that. I'm just not sure how the, how the mess was handled during that period of time. We were here for two weeks um, through Christmas. I always thought it was a little cruel to mobilize the unit on the 23rd of, of December, but cruelty was not in the minds, I'm sure, of the uh, commanders who made the decision. Uh, finally, uh, we were ready to go to Robinson on about the 7th of January, 1941. We marched from the armory down Commercial Street to the Santa Fe Railroad Station in a blinding snowstorm. It snowed heavily that day in Emporia, and uh, a troop train that originated out in western Kansas around Dodge City and Garden City came moving east along the Santa Fe line, picking up troops at, at every all the other cities and towns where there were National Guard units, came to Emporia. We boarded the train, and we're off on the great adventure and on about January the 7th or 8th, I think it was the 8th, uh, after an overnight trip by train, we were uh, at, at, uh, at Camp Robinson, Arkansas, ready to start our active duty training. Boy, just before we leave Emporia, how was the send-off? Did many townspeople come yes. out? Yes, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Snowstorm just, and all. Despite the weather, the, uh, of course the band, 161st Artillery Band was going, so we had the band, we had the, the, the infantry company, and the streets, the streets were lined with people. You know, the turnout was, was, was terrific. And also, you feel good also at the station. Did I feel good? I, I was exhilarated, yeah. Uh, I don't think my parents went down, my, my dad might have been traveling, I don't remember. I don't think my parents went down to see me off. I don't think any of my family went down to see me off. They were we were not a militaristic family in the sense that we were gung-ho about the military. You have to understand, as I said, I joined the Guard because of the, not out of patriotism as much as out of the financial opportunity that it provided. That may sound strange, but it, but it was true at the time. That, that leads me to another question that perhaps I should have asked before, and that's this. At, at, as we come up into the late, into the mid to late 30s, the world is boiling up. Hitler is on the move. The Japanese are on the move in Asia. Totalitarianism seems to be the thing. How much attention did you and your family give to these international events? Well, that's uh, that's a. I'm I'm really glad you asked that question, as they say. And the reason I am is because uh, radio was the instrument of communication, along with newspapers, and radio was burgeoning with the war news at that time. Uh, the local station was a, uh, an affiliate of the Mutual Broadcasting System, and we did a lot of listening to the radio. Uh, news reports at that time were 15 minutes in length. You didn't get a minute of news or five minutes of news. You got a quarter hour of news 
uh, at least four times a day, early morning, noon, evening meal time, and uh, around bedtime at night. Uh, we listened to the radio a lot. It was our principal source of, of information, and we read the newspapers avidly. One, so we paid a lot of attention to what was going on in the world. We were, con my family was concerned about it. How, how was it as a subject as compared to say the de depression? Uh, a subject of interest, yeah. I should say, in your family. Right in our family, the uh, we were looking ahead and we were anticipating what might be difficult times and the war in Europe was more paramount in our thinking at that time than was the Depression. By the way, what was your father doing during this time? My father, after he, uh, as I said, he went back to Adrian and, t and was a superintendent there for a year, and uh, uh, that would have been the year of 36-37. In 1937, and he'd done this in the summers before to supplement his income, he would go out when we were in Missouri and sell school supplies in the summertime to a rural school district. He uh, got a job uh, with Harlow Publishing Company of Oklahoma City. Harlow Publishing Company published uh, workbooks and manuals and uh, print material for schools. And my dad had the uh, had Kansas as his. Uh, I take it that was his job then after that, he right. moved him. After he finished, after he at, yeah. After he finished at, at Adrian, he he became a, a salesman mm -hmm. of of school supplies. Interestingly enough, during the war, as the manpower drained the younger people, my dad was superintendent of for I think two years, uh, one year in a little town. And I, I'd forgotten all about this. One year in a little town in Kingman County, and I can't remember the name of the town, but if I could, if I could uh, see a map, I think I could identify it. And the other place was Waverly, out east of Emporia. For one year, he was superintendent of schools. And later in my military career, after, <clears throat> as I was closing it out, and I had to leave, I. This had to be in 1945 because I was on leave and I went over to the high school and talked about uh, some uh, in Waverly and talked about some of my school experiences. So my dad became a filler uh, substitute superintendent for these schools who this needed was, an administrator. Yeah, this for a couple of years. And then I don't remember how long after the war he continued to travel for Harlow. Not very long. He was, he was getting up there in years, and he retired, and uh, they moved back to uh, Springfield, Missouri, where their roots really were. Both my mother and father, and lived there, and and uh, they're buried there in a cemetery in in Springfield. Well, we I uh, interrupted you. Uh, you were arriving at. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, how was the train trip to Fort Robinson? Not bad. It was it was okay. Yeah, uh, we didn't have Pullmans, but uh, as I recall, we didn't. But the chair cars were clean and comfortable and modern, and uh, it it was it was a short trip. The, the war pressure on train travel hadn't started. No, yeah. no, it, it it had not. The special troop train was an unusual event, but uh, that had happened before because we took a troop train up to Minnesota in uh, in 39. So uh, troop trains for the National Guard were a common thing in the summer in Kansas and I'm sure in other states as well. When we got down to Robinson, the camp really wasn't ready for us. It, it was just barely functional. They were still doing a lot of work on latrines and mess halls. Camp Robinson was what <clears throat> I would call a tent camp primarily. You had, for a company, you had uh, probably about 24 tents housing about six or eight people to a tent, I believe six people to a tent, and uh, each platoon had a row of tents, so there were four rows of tents, and then the permanent buildings, semi-permanent, were a mess hall 
in the kitchen attached up at the head of the so-called company street as it were and then there was a latrine which was sort of back and down you had a block of a battalion you had four companies company a from atchison uh, b from emporia c from council grove all rifle companies and d was the heavy weapons company for the first battalion uh, and that company was from Dodge City. And uh, then we had a battalion headquarters unit, which had been originated in Cottonwood Falls and, uh, and Strong City. Uh, so those were the units that were clustered about. Uh, the workmen, civilians, were still doing a lot of finishing work on roads, paving roads. Uh, we did a lot of work ourselves. We built uh, sidewalks and uh, graveled, would get gravel and put it in areas. Arkansas <clears throat> has a lot of red clay and Camp Robinson was filled with red clay. And when it got uh, wet, it was sticky and uh, extremely difficult. You couldn't walk through it and then walk into a tent or a barracks without tracking up the whole thing. So one of our first jobs was to find rock to line walkways and then find gravel to put on so we could get to the latrine and to the mess hall and to our tents without having to uh, go through the uh, through the, the the mud, particularly when it was, when it was wet. So we spent some time sort of housekeeping and getting ready, and then we started through a cycle of basic of 13 weeks uh, basic training. I don't know how many times I went through basic training in the Army because I went through a lot of different units, but uh, basic training is basic training, and uh, you do the usual things, weapons familiarization, close order drill, uh, just getting shaped up to be ready to, to be a serious soldier. And that's what we did uh, initially at uh, Camp Robinson. We did the 13 weeks of basic training. What did you think of that basic training? It was not very good, uh, and uh, I, the military can do some great, has done, and I've seen some really great training uh, done by the military. Again, at Camp Robinson, most of the training was done by the officers and the non-coms. And honest to goodness, in some instances, the enlisted men and the non-coms were really teaching some of the officers uh, how to do their particular chores. I remember one particular instance, a chap uh, who got a commission in ROTC from uh, the University of Kansas at Lawrence, Mark Alexander, a wonderful officer, Mark Alexander, wonderful, wonderful officer, but he didn't know anything <laughs> about weapons. And he was assigned as an officer to the uh, a weapons platoon in Company B, and honestly, the enlisted men and the non-coms in that weapons platoon taught Mark Alexander all that he turned out to know. Did you happen to be in that platoon? I wasn't. I was in the first platoon and the rifle platoon, but I want to say another word about Mark Alexander. He later became uh, a paratrooper and volunteered and had an exceedingly illustrious career. He was plan in a planning session for a drop one time, and he was meeting with the Brits, and he was a major, I think, at the time, and he spoke up and made a comment, and one of the British generals says, <coughs> Major, when we want your opinion, we will ask for it. Uh, but Mark Alexander turned out to be quite a guy. But we were all learning together at Camp Robinson. We were teaching and training each other. Uh, we didn't have a lot of instructional aids. But what was happening was we were, we were getting clothing, we were getting kitchen equipment, we were getting vehicles, and we got the new M1 rifle. Big, a big deal. The Springfield 03 was a weapon that had really served its time, and the Durand, G-A-R-A-N-D, the inventor of the rifle, produced the M1 rifle, and uh, it was a much more effective weapon. You had a clip of eight. You could put the clip in and shoot eight rounds without having to reload. 
Or, and without having to re-pull the trigger. Yes, it, right. It was automatic right. Fire. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. So we, we had that new experience, and uh, the preparation was leading up to um, maneuvers in the summer of uh, 1941, that would be 1941. After we finished basic training, we got leave, by the way, and there was a good deal of traffic flowing back between Emporia. Uh, some of the more adventurous soldiers, uh, <clears throat> very few of us had cars, but there were two or three cars, and I know a lot of soldiers would make a weekend trip back to get a three-day pass, push off on Friday night, drive from Little Rock to Emporia, and of course no interstate, so it took a bit, and then back on Sunday evening or Sunday night uh, to be ready for drill on Monday. And there were a lot of visitors from Emporia at Camp uh, Robinson, and they came down and uh, would visit. I know on Mother's Day, a lot of my mother didn't come, but a lot of mothers came, and uh, that was a big celebration. They ate in the mess hall with us, and uh, we were all spruced up and on our best behavior. There were some nice e events of that, that type. Well, that's, that's an appropriate place for me to ask this. Some of the uh, members of Company B have told me that they considered Camp Robinson pretty much a fun time. I didn't. Uh, I, I know some people, uh, I have a friend, K.U. Hobson Crockett, and Hobson was a cook among other things. <laughs> he wasn't a cook in civilian life, uh, but he, he was a cook. And I said to Hobson one time when I saw him at a high school reunion or there later, Hobson, I said, you were really goofing off down at Camp Robinson. And he said, well, weren't we all? And, uh, and uh, uh, I think there was some of that. They, they saw it as a lark and as, as an adventure. I must say I didn't. Uh, I, took it, I, I took it seriously. In spite of the fact that you thought the training was fairly rudimentary. Mm -hmm. rudimentary and yeah. I still took it seriously. I just, I just thought it was, well, I was, by that time, when we were mobilized, I was a corporal. And uh, so when I went to Robinson, I didn't have any latrine duty or KP or that sort of thing. I was a squad leader and had corporal stripes. And then shortly after we got to Robinson, I was promoted to a three-striper, a sergeant. And uh, <clears throat> we had a sergeant uh, who was a platoon sergeant. And we had another sergeant, Jack Snow, uh, who was a uh, platoon guide. And I looked up to those two people, Jim Wagner, was the platoon uh, sergeant. I, we had a lot of different second and first lieutenants come in to be platoon leaders because they were, there was a shifting of personnel, uh, particularly in the non-commissioned ranks and the com uh, company grade officer, first, second lieutenants and captains. There was a great shifting of personnel. Captain Don Ellen did not stay with us for an extended period of time. He was a little hefty. He was he was obese and uh, um, handled himself pretty well, moved pretty well. But he was also over age and grade. And Captain Don Allen was uh, mustered out at uh, at some time pretty early on. And we had as our company commander then um, there were brothers Gerald O'Connell and Tom O'Connell. Uh, both of them were from Emporia and uh, had worked on the Santa Fe Railroad. They were uh, a couple of people who were not college students, but Tommy O'Connell became our company commander after Captain Joe um, <coughs> was uh, retired. And uh, we had a succession of company commanders uh, that, that came along at that time. One thing that I did, and maybe this is why I had a slightly different slant, uh, we had a fellow in the unit named Vic Peck, and Vic had uh, worked at the local radio station KTSW that I m mentioned earlier. He was on the paid staff there, uh, and he was a student at Emporia State. And uh, Vic got the assignment to, he was a sergeant, he got the assignment to write uh, columns for the Emporia Gazette, to write uh, a weekly or <clears throat> occasional or every now and then, I forget the frequency, um, for, the, for the local newspaper. I 
either volunteered or was asked to uh, write some uh, news stories for the bulletin, the university newspaper, where I had tinkered around in uh, my sophomore and junior years a little bit. So I did that. And then Peck got busy and got some other assignments, and he gave up the Gazette column and the writing for the Gazette, and I took it over. So I had, this was an extracurricular job that I was doing for no money, but it was something I enjoyed doing. I had a typewriter, uh, didn't type well, but uh, I, I could type the information. And the 35th Division set up a press school. So every Monday night, uh, we would go into Little Rock in a two and a half ton truck, be driven into the Central High School in Little Rock, famous later on for the integration of the uh, black students in the Little Rock High School where Eisen, when Eisenhower was president and sent in the Airborne Division to ensure the safety of the, what was it, nine <coughs> Little Rock uh, black students who uh, integrated Little Rock High School. And that's where we had our, our journalism classes. And uh, they would they would give us tips and clues on on how to write and what the military wanted us to write uh, and that sort of thing. So were I these, got were these run by the military? Uh, no, there was. A, <clears throat> I think the 35th Division set it up, but the instructor was a civilian, and I it, it was under the auspices of somebody at Camp Robinson, whether it was the camp or somebody in the division. I don't know, Lauren, but the instructor was a a civilian. But we learned and from each other, so, so I, I did that as well. But back to your question, I took that military training serious. I just thought it was a, it was a serious situation. And I, we, we had some good times. Um, we had a great basketball team. Company B won the division championship, beating the Warrensburg, uh, Missouri team, the uh, 35th Division headquarters was at Warrensburg, and that company was made up of a lot of college students from Warrensburg. And we, we would go to play basketball in Pine Bluff. And Did you play? I played, yes. Okay. I was not a starter, but we had eight or ten players, and, uh, and I played. Uh, I can still remember some of the other players. Uh, Jack Snow, who had played at Emporia State, KSDC, was on the team. Uh, two C of E players, Orly and Feep, and I can't remember, that's what we called him, Feep Deputy. Uh, he was uh, a, uh, a mess sergeant, and Orly, uh, who was in the weapons platoon, the two deputy brothers were there, and uh, Alvin Morris, who later uh, turned out to be the superintendent of schools in Wichita for a long, 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 long tenure. Um, and uh, Glenn Martin and myself and Bill Obley, I believe. There are a couple of others, 